right there. On the Bro. topic, right there. Brad was. <laughs> <laughs> The whole city rejoiced. Fireworks were lit in the public gardens. Bands played all night in the ballrooms. And flags and banners waved from every rooftop. She was very beautiful. But what princess isn't? Being beautiful is their profession. Princess Mariposa spent most of her time shopping. The dress designers let her buy dresses at half price because she wore them at fashionable parties and made the designers famous. If you want to buy things cheap, it helps to be rich. Strange as it seems, poor people always have to pay the full price. At last we will have an heir, the people said, for they had been afraid that the dynasty would come to an end. But time went by, and more time, and no child came to Prince Otto and Princess Mariposa. They sought the opinions of the finest doctors, but still no child came. They made a pilgrimage to Rome to seek the blessing of the Holy Father, but still no child came. Finally, as Princess Mariposa stood at the palace window, she heard the chiming of the cathedral clock and said, I wish I had a child, as sound as a bell and as true as a clock. And when she had said those words, she felt her heart lift. And before the year was out, she did have a child, but Alas for her and for everyone, her labour was hard and painful, and when the baby had taken one breath in the world, he could take no more, and he died in the arms of the nurse. Princess Mariposa knew nothing of that, for she was in a dreadful swoon, and no one could say whether she would live or die. As for Prince Otto, he was nearly out of his mind with fury. I will have an heir, come what may. And he snatched the dead child from the nurse's arms. Even Prince Otto, in his madness, didn't believe that a clockwork toy could resemble a living child. But then, the silver they mined in Schatzberg was not the same as other metals. It was malleable, and soft, and lustrous, with a bloom on it like that of a butterfly's wing. And as for Palminius, the task was a challenge to his artistry that he couldn't resist. And so, while Prince Otto buried the dead child, Dr. Calminius set to work to make a new one. He smelted the ore and refined the silver and beat it into a subtle thinness. He spun gold into filaments finer than spider silk and attached each one separately to the little head. 
he carved and filed and tempered. He soldered and riveted and bolted. He tied and adjusted and regulated until the main spring was tight and the little escapement on its jeweled bearings was ticking back and forth with perfect accuracy. Dr. Carminis showed him to Prince Otto. The baby was breathing and moving and smiling and even by some secret art warm. Prince Florian is ill. What can we do? Hmm. It's in the nature of clockwork to run down. His mainspring was bound to weaken. His escapement clog with dust. I can tell you what will happen next. His skin will stiffen and crack and split from top to bottom to reveal nothing but dead, seized up metal inside of him. He will never work again. But why didn't you tell me this would happen? You were in such a hurry that you didn't ask. Can't you just wind him up? Impossible. But what can we do? Is there nothing that can save his life? I must have an heir. The survival of the royal family depends on it. There is one thing. He is failing because he has no heart. Find him a heart and he will live. But I don't know where you'll find a heart in good condition that its owner is willing to part with. Besides, but Prince Otto didn't stop to hear what Dr. Carminius was going to say. What the great clockwork maker had been going to say was this. The heart that is given must also be kept. But quite possibly Prince Otto wouldn't have understood anyway. He rode back to the palace, turning the problem over in his mind. And what a dilemma. To save his son, he had to sacrifice another human being. What could he do? And whom could he ask to make such a great sacrifice?
Delgratz. Of course, there was no one better. Baron Stelgratz was an old, trusted advisor, a staunch friend, faithful, brave and true. The little prince loved him, and he and the Baron used to play for hours with Plunce Florian's toy soldiers. And the good old nobleman would teach him how to handle a sword or fire a pistol and tell him all about the animals of the forest. The more Prince Otto thought about it, the better a choice it seemed. Baron Stelgratz would leap at the chance to give his heart for the family. Better not tell him yet, though. Better wait till they reached Schatzberg. Then he would see the necessity quite clearly. But as the winter of the prince's tenth year set in, the dreaded symptoms returned. Prince Florian complained of pains in his joints, of a stiffness in his arms and legs, of a constant chill, and his voice lost its human expressiveness and took on the tinkling sound of a musical box. Just as before, the royal physician was baffled. He has inherited this disease from his father. There can be no question about that. But what disease is it? A congenital weakness of the heart combined with inflammatory oxidosis. But if you remember, your highness, we cured that last time by means of healthy exercise in the forest. What Prince Florian needs is a week at the hunting lodge. But last time he went with his father and Baron Stelgratz. And you know what happened then? Ah, medical science has advanced wonderfully in the past five years. Have no fear, your highness. We shall arrange a hunting trip for the little prince and he will come back glowing with health, just as he did before. But it seemed that the courtiers had less faith in the advance of medical science than the physician, for they all remembered what had happened last time, and none of them wanted to risk a journey through the forest, even if it was to save Prince Florian. This one, had a broken toe. That one had to visit his grandmother in Berlin. And so on and so on. There was no question of the physician himself going. He was needed every moment at the palace, in case of an emergency. And Princess Mariposa could not possibly go because the winter air was so bad for her complexion. Finally, because there was no one else to do it, they called up one of the grooms and offered him ten silver pieces in advance to take little Prince Florian to the hunting lodge. The groom tucked Prince Florian into the sledge and harnessed the horses. Princess Mariposa waved from the tower as they drove by. When they had gone some way into the forest, the groom thought, I don't think this child can last another day. He looks pretty bad to me. And if I go back and tell them he's died, they're bound to punish me. On the other hand, with ten silver pieces and the sledge, I can make my way over the border and set up in business on my own account. Buy a little inn, maybe find a wife and have some children of my own. Yes, that's what I'll do. There's nothing that can save this little fellow. I'm doing him a kindness, really. He was very tall and thin, with a prominent nose and jaw. His 
eyes blazed like coals in caverns of darkness. His hair was long and grey, and he wore a black cloak with a loose hood like that of a monk. He had a harsh, grating voice, and his expression was full of savage curiosity. And that was the man who, who, oh, this is impossible. How am I to write an ending to this story? I'll have to make it up when I get there and hope I do it well. If I come up with something good, the devil can have my soul. At the same time as she was feeling her way down the stairs in Fritz's lodging house, Carl was going back to the inn. Carl had taken little Florian up to the clock tower and fastened him to the frame, ignoring the prince's helpless struggles and his musical requests for mercy. When morning came, there he would be, Carl's masterpiece on show as everyone expected. Then he could leave the town and make his way with Sir Iron Soul into a world of fame and fortune. But as he opened the door of the inn, he felt a shiver of fear. He stood on the threshold, afraid and unwilling to enter, taking no notice of Pootsie the cat. Now there is no need to be superstitious about cats, but they are our fellow creatures, and we shouldn't ignore them. It would have been polite of Carl to offer his knuckles for the old thing to rub his head against. But Carl was wound up too tightly for politeness, so he didn't see Pootsie. Finally Carl gathered his courage, how still the room was, and how sinister that little figure, and that sword point, <gasps> how wickedly sharp. Some coals settled in the stove. Carl jumped nervously. The glow made him think of the fires of hell, and he began to sweat. Oh, I can't bear this. I've done nothing wrong, have I? Why am I so nervous? What is there to be fear? Oh, what the devil! He clapped his hands to his mouth as if trying to clam the word back inside. But it was too late. No, no, stop, wait, the tune, let me whistle the tune. He stumbled away, trying to hum, to sing, to whistle, but all he could do was cry and stammer and sob, and the night came closer and closer. So let's close our eyes and think of something else for a moment. Carl is ticking his final talk. The next morning came. All through the town, Visitors and townsfolk alike were getting dressed and eating their breakfasts, hungrily, eager to see the new figure in the famous clock. The fragrance of roasting coffee and freshly baked rolls drifted through the streets. And as time drew on towards ten o'clock, a strange rumour went round the town. The clockwork maker's apprentice has been found dead, murdered. The police called Herr Ringelman in to look at the body. The old clockmaker was shocked and dismayed to see his apprentice lying dead. The poor boy, it was his day of fame. Whatever can have happened, what a disaster. Who could have done this terrible thing? 
Do you recognize this figure, Herr Ringelmann? This clockwork knight? No, I've never seen it before in my life. Is that Karl's blood on its sword? I'm afraid so. Do you think he could have made this figure? No, not at all. Certainly not. The figure he made is up in the clock. That's a tradition. He was going to fit his new figure in the clock on the last evening of his apprenticeship, just as I did in my time. Carl was a good boy, a little quiet and morose, perhaps, but a good apprentice. I'm sure he did what he was supposed to do, and we'll see his new figure when it comes out. What a sad occasion. The new figure will have to be his memorial, poor boy. Nothing was right that morning. The innkeeper was desperately anxious because Gretel was missing. What could have happened to her? The whole town was in a ferment. A crowd had gathered outside the inn and they watched the policeman carrying out Carl's body on a stretcher covered by a piece of canvas. But they didn't look that way for long because it was nearly 10 o'clock and the time had come for the mechanism to reveal the new figure. All eyes turned upwards. There was even more interest than usual because of the strange circumstances of Carl's death. And the square was so crowded that you couldn't see the cobbles. People were crammed shoulder to shoulder and every face was turned up like a flower to the sun. The hour began to strike. And then came the new figure. But it wasn't one figure. It was two. Two sleeping children. A girl and a boy. So lifelike and beautiful that they didn't seem to be made of clockwork at all. A gasp of surprise went up from the crowd as the two little figures yawned and stretched and looked down, clutching each other for fear of the height, and yet laughing and chatting together in the bright morning light, and pointing out the sights around the square. But Herr Ringelman had his suspicions and peered upwards shading his eyes and then the innkeeper looking up with everyone else saw who it was and gave a cry of joy it's my gretel she's safe gretel gretel keep still we'll come up and bring you down safely don't move out of the night and out of the past gretel had made florian a present of her heart and what they were looking at was the future the prince wasn't clockwork anymore he was a child as real as any other the heart that is given must also be kept no one could guess where the little boy had come from and Florian couldn't remember. Everyone accepted that he had been lost and that they had better look after him. So they did. As for the metal knight, Herr Ringelman took it away to his workshop to examine it closely. When they asked him about it later, he could only shake his head. I don't know how anyone expected that to work. It's full of bits and pieces, broken springs, missing cogs, rusty gears, worthless rubbish. I do hope Carl didn't make it. The one person who might have been able to tell them the truth was Fritz. But he'd left town before the sun rose and he never came back. He was going to stop writing fiction altogether 
until he found that he could earn lots of money by making up speeches for politicians. As for what happened to Dr. Calmenius, who can say? He was only a character in a story, after all. And if Gretel knew more than anyone, she said nothing about it. She had lost her heart to the prince and kept it too, which was how he came to be turned from clockwork into boy. So they both lived happily ever after. And that was how they all wound up.